Alright, I'm back and I brought a haircut. Hello YouTube, I'm Dark Sammy 101 and I have a swivel chair now. Yeah. So we've been away for a long, yeah. long ass time and um it doesn't exactly look like I've gone anywhere, but trust me I have. And that might explain why I've been so inactive, like I just dropped off the face of YouTube. That I apologize for. That was just I don't know what I was doing. Should have left some form of explanation, but this is the I I don't know. Just don't know. Fucked up. Basically, what happened? Gonna sum it up in one word. University happened. That's pretty much everything as to why I've been gone. Studying for exams, preparing for university. Getting all the shit together, moving to university, settling into university. The, the list goes on as to why I've been just, just fucking nowhere. But that doesn't mean to say I haven't been thinking about you guys. Because I have, and I've been working on that. So yeah, university. That's a thing for me now. Anyway, Uncharted! So, like the normal functioning human being that I am, I played Uncharted 2 among thieves before Uncharted 1. In fact, Uncharted 2 was one of the first games I played on the PS3. Yeah, that's right. Uncharted 2 was one of the first games I played for the PS3. Because I don't play anything in order, because fuck Uncharted 1, am I right? Yeah, if you think that's a little weird, try to wrap your head around the fact that I got the game before the fucking console. Yeah, that's some Alice in Wonderland logic right there. So yeah, Uncharted 2 is my first foray into the Uncharted series, and honestly, after playing Uncharted Drake's Fortune, it's clear Naughty Dog raised their game a fuck ton. I honestly don't think you need to play Drake's Fortune after playing Uncharted 2. This game is amazeballs. It looks fantastic, and it looks so much more fucking genuine than the original Uncharted. Jesus Christ, I don't have to look at the colour palette of this game and think why the fuck does everything look so wrong. The colours mesh together in a much more collaborative fashion than in the previous game. It's more genuine, more realistic. You know, I'm not expecting Aku Aku to come bursting in from the game from the bushes, you know? I think this is highlighted in the fact that Uncharted 2 tries to go on a much bigger adventure than its predecessor did. I mean, I'm not trying to bash Uncharted 1 for its sense of adventure, because it had that, but Uncharted 2, it just felt bigger. Like it was trying to bring you into sort of globe-trotting sort of quest. Uncharted 1, they did travel from place to place, but it was mostly contained to the same island. And all I can remember from said island is a lot of old ruins and a lot of jungle. I, d I just can't shake the connection with jungle to Uncharted 1. Uncharted 2, I don't have that sense of con isolation to a single specific type of location. It was a whole mash of urban warfare, just fucking, yes there are jungles and forests and shit, and just a whole load of ice and cold sort of stuff. Oh, speaking of Uncharted 1, as we move on to controls, thank Christ you got rid of the motherfucking jet ski and all other vehicle modes. Because fuck, that was so fucking annoying. The gameplay remains pretty much the same in terms of the third person shooter style, but it introduces a new melee aspect to it. It's not the most in depth, but it's there. But something that seems to have had a lot more time invested into it is the stealth mechanic. I don't know why I'm so surprised about the whole stealth aspect of this game. I mean, the game's fucking subtitle is Among Thieves. I don't know what the fuck I was thinking. The platforming is also a lot better. It doesn't feel clunky, it doesn't look like Nate jumps like Mario. No, there's no more frustrating deaths in the platforming regard. 
Oh ho ho, no! The frustrating deaths come in the form of dying over and over and over again in a ridiculous legions of respawn army that comes out of fucking nowhere. I know you have to challenge the whole third person shooter aspect of this game, but sometimes I just feel like the number of enemies that they throw at you, or the number of bloody fucking shotgun shells and how easily and how quickly they die, I feel like sometimes it's a bit bloody on a few puzzles in this game, but most of the so-called puzzles are more like platforming challenges than real puzzles. The puzzles that are in this game, however, are kind of easy, but they do take at least a few minutes of thought to go into them. And just, you know, a few minutes of flipping through Nate's journal, which is absolutely hilarious. Can we just talk about how amazing this is, i.e. the many faces of Victor Goddamn Sullivan? Little details, little touches like that in a game are fucking amazing. Anyway, story time. The game begins with Nathan Drake, our hero, waking up on a train. And in one second, I can already tell he's not in England. Why? Well, you fall asleep on a British train, this tends to happen to you. Oh. D, you immature bastard. I'm not going to deny it, I am an immature bastard. So yeah, Nate's train isn't just stuck at the signal box or some other bullshit you have to deal with on a regular train. And he's bleeding pretty damn fierce. So with that in mind, can I just say Nate's a fucking machine? I mean, Jesus actual Christ, this man is bleeding so heavily that his entire left hand side is drenched in his own blood, has fallen out of a train dangling off the side of a mountain, smashes into the railing at the end of the cart, and still somehow manages to have the Terminator grip to hold on for dear life. Is this man indestructible or something? Captain Scarlet Indestructible Captain Scarlet Okay, see, so that was just meant to be a joke, but... Well, the resemblance is kind of eerie. Fuck, maybe Nate is indestructible. You wouldn't think from the fucking gunfights, though! Nate manages to climb up and out of the destroyed train car and make it back onto solid ground before he passes the fuck out, like, like a regular person. We cut back to about four months earlier, where he's found upon by two people we've never seen before. Harry Flynn and Chloe Frazier, both of whom having had some previous dealings with Drake in the past. I've got a job for us. Really? A client is willing to part with a huge sum of cash if we acquire a certain object for him. And I'm listening. Now, yeah. you're not going to like this. Oh, no. No, you're out of your mind. Yeah, you just, just hear me out for no, a second. Flynn, we both know two people who were killed trying to lift something out of this and place. And one who made it out. Yeah, barely. All right, look. I've got it all figured out. We go in through the sewer. I'm loving it so far. That puts us in the courtyard. From there, we scale up the wall, run across the rooftops, and just drop down into the exhibit hall. Bob's your uncle. And what is worth all this trouble, I hear you ask? I didn't, but go ahead. <laughs> but that's it. An oil lamp. Yeah. <laughs> it's worthless. I don't get it. But there's more. How's your 13th century Latin, mate? To be 100% honest, that is not the worst come on I've heard at the bar. No, that one goes to, hey baby, I want to turn my dick into a diamond. You want to apply the pressure? Hello. I heard you were talking shit. I now regret every decision I've ever made leading up to this point. Anyway, the writings that Harry thrusts upon Nate reveal that the nutcase he's working for right, is to find the, the lost fleet of the Marco Polo and the Mongolian treasure that was loaded on board. What I love about the backstory that Naughty Dog creates for this game is that it somehow takes the actual historical events of what happened to Marco Polo and his fleet and then makes this awesome his awesome flip of the fiction. It somehow manages to combine 
actual history, traditional Buddhist beliefs, and then put their own spin on it to make a style that's completely unique and their own. And I find it fascinating. Nate comes to again in the present day and makes his way through the wreckage of the train to come across a strange artifact, almost like a dagger. He then collapses again and we flash back to when Nate and his team break into the museum in order to get the Mongolian lamp. Of course everything goes off without a hitch as Nate and Flynn make it to the expedition hall and break open the oil lamp. What are you doing? It's resin, it'll burn. And? Just give me your lighter. Let me see that. Shambhala. Oh my god, Flynn. What? Marco Polo found Shambhala. Shangri-La. You're joking. Of course, this is uncharted, so Nate can't exactly have it easy. Sorry, mate. This is where we part ways. Wait, Flynn, we had a plan. No, you had a plan. Turns out I've got one of my own. Flynn, listen. Face it, genius. You've been played. Three months later, Nate's bailed out of prison hey, hey, hey. thanks to Sully Jack. with the help of Chloe. They plan to sneak Nate into the camp of Lazarevich, no, this game's villain, to look up more of the extracts on Marco Polo's journals. Man, this Lazarevich guy isn't screwing around, Sully. You should see all this stuff. He's got files on every expedition to find Shambhala, all the way back to the 1600s. What about Marco Polo's journals? <laughs> Here they are. Just hurry it up, you haven't got much time. Wait a minute. Damn. Sully, I don't think the Chintamani Stone is here. What? Listen to this. I, I would have sooner endured the wrath of Kublai Khan himself than remove the Chintamani Stone from that sacred shrine. Marco Polo never had the stone. Then what dreadful cargo is he talking about? I don't know. Well, if the stone's not here, what the hell is Lazarovich looking for? Shambhala. Here in Borneo? He's a little wide of the mark, don't you think? He must be trying to pick up Marco Polo's trail. Back to Shambhala. Why? <laughs> because the stone is still there. Hold up, back up a sec. The Chinta Mining Stone is basically this big blue stone that's about as hard as a rock. Guess that pickup line does work, Steve. <sighs> Chloe, can you talk? Hold on. Yeah, I'm here. In all this digging they've done, have they found any bodies, any remains at all? No, now that you mention it, nothing. Why? <laughs> Over 600 people were shipwrecked here, yet there's no bodies. Don't you find that a little odd? So where did they all go? Where would you go if a tsunami hit? To higher ground. <laughs> would you look at that? Oh, yeah. Hey. Hello. What do we have here? With any luck, the last resting place of Marco Polo's crew. What do we have here? Oh. Man, is that an ugly friggin' thing. What is it? Some kind of weapon? No, no, it's a, a purba. It's a ritual object from Tibet. Nate, you can call that thing whatever the fuck you want. It is still an expensive looking shank. Could this be what Marco Polo was talking about? Kid, I don't even know what the hell you're talking about. <laughs> In his journal, he wrote that the worthy seeker would be given a golden passport to conquer obstacles on the journey to Shambhala. So, what, this is it? Look, that's all really interesting, but where the hell is it a passport to? Well, maybe this map would help. Let me see that. <laughs> Between Greater India and the province of Tibet lies a field of exquisitely finished temples, hundreds of gilded spire stretching as far as the eye can see. Anyway, they get cornered by Flynn and sent off down to meet with Lazarevich. Flynn, being a fucking idiot, and not realising that Chloe is double-crossing him. She ends up getting Sully and Nate free, and the two men go their separate ways, and Nate heads off to meet with Chloe to find a temple that the map spoke of. Hmm. You know, somehow this story doesn't seem complicated enough, so let's throw even more characters in! Whoa! Hey, hey, don't you! Hey! <sighs> Nate? What the hell are you doing here? Elena? Where the fuck have you been, bitch? I nearly put you in the same box as Alex from the Tomb Raider movies. So yeah, Elena's Sorry. apparently back on the board. 
along with her cameraman and obviously not going to die character, Jeff. Let me guess, Jeff's a dead man, isn't he? Yeah, there have been way too many characters in this game, you and all, to consider the fact that someone named Jeff is going to change the course of the game in any dramatic fashion. I don't mean to be mean here, guys, but seriously, if your name's Jeff, you may as well resign yourself to the fact the most exciting thing you'll be in life is a systems analyst. Nathan drags Elena and Jeff to the temple that supposedly holds the path to Shambhala so that they don't get shot to death by Lazarevich, whilst he and Chloe go further inside in order to find the supposed entrance to Shambhala. Well, considering the fact that we see Nate on a mountainside later in the game, I'm gonna go a wild stab in the dark and say that Shambhala isn't there. No, of course it's not there. They have to go somewhere else to find the entrance to Shambhala. It's like when they kept on moving fucking El Dorado in the last game. Fucking called that shit. So, somehow, Lazarevich finds a little ragtag group and his militia ends up shooting the fuck out of them and the temple. Oh, and of course, Jeff has been shot in the ensuing chaos. <sighs> sorry, I, I did say... I'm, I'm really sorry about this, Jeff, but... You had a good run, at least. Oh, but instead of doing the obvious choice, Drake has to be the fucking hero and carry the bleeding man through the rainy, crumbling, most definitely now infected with whoever knows what plague streets. Okay, Nate. I get that you were trying to be the hero here, but... He's a dead man unless you have Roy Mustang on speed dial. Chloe, ever practical and logical, tells Nate to leave Jeff behind. Nate has none of it, however, and Chloe decides to cut her losses. I.e. Drake. I was trying to save your skin, you idiot. Fucking bitch. Oh, and then Flynn shows up, completely oblivious to the fact that Chloe has been betraying him the entire time. Drop the guns. Seriously. Get her out of here. She's hurt. Fucking c**t. Lazarevich then shows up and takes the map that Nate made, kills Jeff and leaves for the train, leaving Flynn to kill Nate and Elena. Lazarevich, are, are you fucking high or something? You actually expect Flynn to do anything right given what's happened so far? The only reason you've got as far as you have done already is because of Nate. Maybe you want to consider swapping business partners? Oh, speaking of which, look at that! No. Nate's escaped. Fucking hell, Flynn, you had one job! You had one job, Flynn! Nate, however, being the fucking messiah, apparently, who could do no wrong, selflessly concocts a plan to rescue Chloe from Lazarevich and Flynn. All hail the messiah, Nathan Drake, for he is all that is man. Nate boards the train, blows up a helicopter, and ends up fighting some butch motherfucker who's so manly he's got no sleeves in the fucking mountains. Has anyone else realised that I don't much skim the plots of my reviews, but more like obliterate them into unrecognisable fragments of a greater whole. <laughs> Save my ass again. Are you alright? Get off the train, Nate. What are you talking about? You have any idea what I've been through? I never asked for any of your bloody heroics. Chloe, come on, we don't have time for this. You're right, so get off the train while you still can. And leave you with them. You made your choice. What did you expect me to do? I expected you to have my back. I had your back. How could you possibly with the other two on yours? Well, good luck with Flynn. We deserve each other. You know, I can't believe... No. You just don't know when to quit, do you? What? No witty remark? Nothing clever to say? I don't. No! Oh, no, you don't! Stop. Just let him go. Put him out of his misery! Okay, 
This motherfucker has been shot, blown up, knocked around, and slammed in more ways than the dark magician on a Saturday night after a disappointing breakup. How the fuck is he still alive? So it's at this point we're back to the beginning of the game. Nate hanging off the edge of a cliff, in a train, bleeding to death in the middle of a fucking blizzard, before Lazarevich respawn army comes and round to try and finish him off. I am sorry that I have to harp on this again, but how is this man alive and functioning? Let alone climbing out of dangling trains and getting into fucking gunfights. Not surprisingly, Nate fucking collapses like a regular human. But only after he's climbed vertically to safety out of a fucking train car, hardcore parkours his way around the wreckage of the rest of the train, picks up his fancy shank and yells about four ways of Lazarevich goons. And then, presumably, after he's achieved all that, he regenerates into Matt Smith because there's no fucking way a regular human could do all that shit. But they don't do that, because Naughty Dog is still doing their best to convince us that he's not superhuman. I'm sorry I keep getting so angry about this, it's just, I know Naughty Dog can do better, more realistic injuries and how people suffer from those injuries. Like, in The Last of Us, and that's just one injury, not an entire fucking A&E ward. So Nate wakes up in a Tibetan village and meets a man it's called Schaefer and Elena, who's apparently just Nate, found him or something. Schaefer. It appears you and I have much in common, Mr. Drake. Is that so? Yes. Seventy years ago, I came here just like you, carried into the village near death, the last survivor of my company. I was hired to lead an expedition into Tibet to find the entrance to Shambhala. What they really wanted was the Chintamani stone. So, my friend, where did you find this? Borneo. Why? This is the key to Shambhala. It's the one object your opponent desperately needs, even if he does not know it yet. <laughs> oh, I think he knows. Look, I'm very grateful for everything you've done for me. I really am, but I'm through with all this. Nate. No, Elena, I'm done. Now, come on, I'm through playing the hero. Your adversary will not give up so easily. He will not stop until he possesses the thing he desires. Oh, yeah? Well, more power to him. Power is precisely the problem. <laughs> Some of the most fearsome rulers through history have possessed only a fragment of the Chintamani stone. Men like Tamburlaine, Genghis Khan. If a mere sliver could bestow such power, what would a man become if he possessed the stone itself? This is crazy. It's got to be what he's after, Nate. Then Lazarevich really is a nutjob. He's chasing a myth. And what if he's not? Am I the only one who's a little bit confused as to why Nate is finding what Shafe is telling him so unbelievable? Considering he has fought Nazi fucking zombies to get the lost gold of El Dorado. I think once you've done that, you lose the right to be sceptical. So in order to find the proof that Nate so desperately needs, he ends up looking for Schaefer's old expedition and comes across what looks to be a yeti. Oh yeah, and the frozen decaying corpses of Schaefer's old crew. Will you help me hide a body? More yeti attack and Nate escapes. Lazarevich, however, has sent a fucking tank into the village to find him. Am I the only one who's really confused as to how Lazarevich keeps finding Nate? I mean, did we miss the bit where he went full Nikolai on us and just drilled a fucking microchip into Nate's head like that episode of Archer? Yeah, screw it. Nate blows up the tank like a motherfucking boss and chases after Lazarevich to rescue the now kidnapped Schaefer. Now, of course, we have to fight our way for another fucking army in order to get there, and when Nate does reach the old guy, he's fucking dying already. Oh! Oh no, Schaefer, not you. I mean I'm not I'm not gonna I'm not gonna miss an opportunity, but kinda liked you. Luckily for Nate and Lazarevich, the monastery that they were using to hold Schaefer while they torture him was actually sitting on top of the secret entrance to Shambhala the entire time. So Nate manages to solve all remaining puzzles, kill some more of Lazarevich's respawn army, and make his way to the entrance of Shambhala. It just so happens he ends up having to drag Lazarevich with him into the Lost City. Look, Nate, 
I know you've got this whole save the world motif going. You need to be the hero here, but if you'd have just kept out of it when they were still in fucking Borneo, they wouldn't have got anywhere near as far as you've led them. I mean, come on. Lazarevich had Flynn leading him. Fucking Flynn. More of the Guardian Sushambala attack, you know, the Yeti things, and they turn out to be um, very constipated bodybuilders by the looks of it. They've literally gone purple. Anyway, Nick manages to fight a way through them and the respawn army in order to find a Chintamani stone. This isn't a sapphire, it's amber. Amber. Yeah, you know, fossilized resin. It's tree sap. Wait a minute. What is it? You gotta be shitting me. Hello, Nate. I hate it when he does this. Tell me about it. How could I have missed it? Missed what? There's not actually a stone. It's the resin, the sap from the Tree of Life. Okay, hold on. Now you've lost me. This tree. No. That tree. There he is. Lazarevich. He's headed to the tree. Oh my god. The black teeth. What? The black teeth on those guardian things and the bodies in Borneo. They ate the resin and it changed them somehow. And you think that's what Lazarevich is planning to do? You really want to wait around and find out? Bravo, shut up. Well done. Flynn? Jesus. Oh, Harry. What's the matter, mate? Disappointed Lazara bitch beat you to it? I'm afraid you just missed him. Figured I'd stay behind and wait for you to come join my little party. What are you talking about? <laughs> Maybe that's what old Zoran wanted all along, eh? He's cleverer than he looks. Well, we can still stop him. <laughs> Elena, don't. No, oh, we can help you. Sorry, love. This isn't a movie, and you're not the plucky girl who reforms the villain and saves the day. It's just not done like that. Flynn, listen to me. You... Parting gift from Nazarevich. Pity he took the pin. God fucking damn it, Flynn. You're not even gonna try and redeem yourself, you fucking on, Elena you ends up getting blown up because she doesn't Stay think to fucking it. run when she sees the grenade in Flynn's hand. Chloe ends up carrying Elena away as Nate takes off to fight Lazarevich one last time. Oh, so now you're a believer, now you can leave her if you tried. Nate ends up fighting Lazarevich in what ultimately comes down to being a spot of Ring Around the Roses, but with bullets. Seriously, all this is is just running around the burning pool and occasionally shooting exploding sap to weaken Lazarevich. Top dot boss fight. I am a monster, but you're no different from me, Drake. How many men have you killed? How many just today? That's it, boy. No compassion, no mercy. Huh? Do it! No. <laughs> you don't have the will. Maybe not. But they do. No! I guess it's a little better than the previous game, I guess. I mean, at least it actually feels like a boss fight this time instead of just having a gauntlet run against the respawn army. Anyway, Nate ends up having to escape the crumbling city of Shambhala with Chloe in tow and Elena in his arms. <laughs> you gotta love Nate's mentality here. Just found paradise. Better blow it up. The game ends with Elena and Nate embracing as they contemplate the future. Again. Is this going to be the pattern with these games? Nate and Elena hook up at the end and look at the sunset. Uncharted 2 is much the same venture as the first game in terms of its gameplay and general plot. The finer details may be tweaked, but it does feel kind of the same. 
The fact that Nate and Elena split up only to get back together again does feel a little bit forced and heavy handed, especially considering we don't know what exactly happened between the two of them to drive them apart. I demand the implied details of the fictitious relationship between these two invented characters, God damn it! The game is fun at times, yes, but too often you will come across a section of the game you will just die constantly playing each and every time you go through, which is a damn shame. Still, the game looks a lot better, looks a lot smoother, and has a much bigger scale in its mind. Villain-wise, I don't really feel much of an impact by Lazarevich, mainly because he wasn't in the game long enough to leave an impression. I wanted to punch Flynn in the face much more than I did Lazarevich. All in all, Uncharted 2 is a lot better, it's a lot prettier package, to say the least, than Uncharted 1, and within which you'll be pleased to discover that it contains no fucking piss-poor vehicles to drive. The character of Nate does get a little confusing, I grant you, but it's forgivable in some of these tiny little details here or there. All in all, I say Uncharted 2 deserves a solid dart rating of 71. Hey, hey, hey! Jackass, you're ruining the show here! And that's all we have time for today, I'm afraid. If you have a suggestion for my next review, please drop it in the comment section below. And if you like what you saw here, you want to see more, please click that subscribe button while you're down there as well. But as always, I've been Darkest Sammy 101. You've been watching Darkest 101 Reviews. Thanks for watching. It's so good to be back, YouTube.